Ladies and gentlemen, we are here at Checkered Past for this is actually episode one. You are the <laughs> guinea pig. You're the guinea pig. I don't wish to put you on the spot, but you are the guinea pig. So the hairs on the back of my neck are standing <laughs> up right now, so well, let's hope it all turns out okay. Oh, it'll turn out fine. That's what editing's for. <laughs> no, so we are here at Checkered Pass down in Dallas, Texas, uh, in God's country. Uh, so you want, you want to inter- uh, introduce yourself? or Yeah. So uh, my name is Sandro DeSanto. I am the winemaker, also the founder of Checkered Past Winery. Uh, And like you said, we're in downtown Dallas. We're an urban winery. Um, And it was a dream of mine for a long time to open up a place downtown that people can have an experience around Texas wines, um, our wines, and uh, just bring the experience to the people as opposed to making them drive all the way out into the country. Gotcha. And find, you know, and go to a tradition, more of a traditional winery in that, in that respect. Well, it reminds me more of a bar, more of a wine bar yeah, than anything else. Yeah, exactly. And we uh, actually call our place uh, a wine pub because I wanted to give the impression, it's a name we made up ourselves, and it, I just wanted to give the impression of kind of like a, a brew pub or something like that because we do also have a fantastic menu we serve food uh wine and uh yeah so i wanted it to be more than just a traditional wine bar there's there's not a lot traditional about checkered pass <laughs> yeah well yeah this is this is excellent this, and, this is 2012 <laughs> uh, i can see you're sipping on something uh something there Todd. hey th- this is uh this is youtube so mm. we we don't have to we we, we can drop f-bombs if we want <laughs> Great. we can we can call each other out we can all <laughs> hey you know what we don't have to do bleep or nothing like that and also on top of that the the whole task and purpose of this is so that you can explain everything that you stand on where you stand how you stand everywhere sure. else in its entirety the the thing that i absolutely hate about any news broadcast is they take a very very complex subject and they turn it into about a 30 second snidbit and it's like it it's it's 1800 pages on that on that bill and you're distilling it down into 30 seconds really you know it just kind of yeah and and you know one of the things that checkered past that we stand for here at checkered past is you know we're trying to make wine more approachable yeah and simplify it and not make it overly complicated uh, in fact, I like to jokingly say that's one of the reasons why Checkered Past exists, is to make wine more approachable to people and uh, and kind of remove some of those scary connotations around wine where people tell me all the time, I wish I knew more about wine, but I don't, and I know I should. And I like to tell them, hey, you only need to know one thing, and that is, do you like it or not? Absolutely. And, and, that's, and that's really how, like... I don't know how. How did you guys come to be? I've never actually. Uh, I've never actually asked you the question. It was a uh, circuitous route <laughs> that we took. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, actually had the um, idea of checkered past uh, started way back in two thousand and eight. Um, like I said, I'm one of the founders. My brother-in-law Scott Relier, who lives in D.C., is also one of the founding partners of Checkered Past, and we came up with this idea about in about 2008 Um, I had been making wine at home in fact we both were making wine at home and uh, we were making wine at my house and the wines were turning out pretty decently and we decided uh, well let's let's enter a few of those wines into competition just for the fun of it and see what they would do so we entered a few in competition and started winning medals and then from there it was just a slippery slope oh well that's (laughs) that's kind of how uh do you know James from OG Sellers? Yes, I do. In yeah, fact. yes, I do. I actually just got to hang out with him. Yeah, him and his wife. So, yeah, we we uh, Jeremy and I went up there on a Sunday, and I don't know, we we went and toured around everything. And a great he, guy. He's been here as well. We've spoken. We've talked. Um, I follow him on Facebook, and they've got the most beautiful sunsets up there. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I would love to go up there and check out well, his place someday. I just. These days, I don't get out very often, unfortunately, <laughs> running a business. Well, well then, so, so you actually sell, actually at this location, you sell Texas wines. 
Yeah, we do. Um, part of the idea of Checkered Past was um, we're still a small industry, obviously. Uh, we're growing greatly. When I got in the business, there was around 200 or so wineries at the time. Now I hear there's over 400 wineries, yeah. and we're growing um, exponentially, really. And it's really fun, actually, to be in like a growing industry, an industry that's expanding, but yet we're still small enough that we all get along. So if I have a problem and I pick up the phone and call somebody, usually somebody will answer on the other <laughs> line. And uh, so we're still small, and we know a lot of us know each other. I don't know as many people as I used to, obviously, as, as we've grown a lot. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we help each other out. And I do believe in the high tide floats all boats. So not only do we carry our own brand of Checkered Pass wine, but we also carry a lot of uh, wines from around Texas. Well, yeah, yeah. And also on top of that, you, I don't know, I, Jeremy and I go to so many vineyards. And we've tried to, we've actually made it a, an objective of ours to actually go out and try every single vineyard. Mm. And so far this year, there's been, what, 50 four fifty five and there's just no way we can go and visit them all because there's more of them opening believe it or not there's more of them opening up than there are weekends that's in wonderful a year. actually yeah and it, i i didn't realize that we have 50 53 or 54 here in north texas alone i i had no idea and actually james was the one that actually told me that uh, a few weekends ago yeah that's pretty amazing if you think about it um, where we were, say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, my God, it's day and night. Now <laughs> the industry has grown so much. Uh, you don't need to travel all the way down to, say, Fredericksburg just to have a really interesting, fun wine experience. You can stay generally in wherever you are in Texas for the most part, kind of local, and explore just the wineries even around your area. That, that wasn't that possible um, I was on a wine trail when I was a winemaker in East Texas for a winery out there, and I think the wineries were spread out like 30 minutes apart. And if you think about a wine trail, <laughs> you can't only hit so many wineries yeah. and then drive that far in between to hit, uh, hit them all up. So now the distances have gotten smaller. Yeah, well the, the numbers have just expanded. The numbers have expanded. So, yeah, it's it's part of really being in that expanding, uh, growing industry that makes uh, the Texas wine industry so amazing and fun. Well, how, how long have you actually been in the Texas wine industry? Um, I started, it's been over 10 years now. In um, yeah, it's been over 10 years. I started, like I said, I was uh, making wine way back, probably about 2005 or so so it's been uh, well over 10 years now wow uh, so over the course of the last 10 years how have you actually seen i mean you, you must have seen a lot you just mentioned a bunch of change and what have you seen that has changed for the good and what have you seen that's that you know the kind of the bad stuff that we probably want to there's not a lot of bad actually most of it is really good i would say some of the most impressive things that i've seen in say the last 10 years is I remember getting fruit from Texas wine make, or, or grape growers, from Texas grape growers, and about 10 years ago, everybody was talking about uh, mostly about just bricks, 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 bricks. What percentage? You're of talking sugar, about the sugar, okay? Yep. Exactly. What percentage of sugar was in the grapes? And um, so there's other parameters that we like to look at as a winemaker. There's other chemical chemistry parameters we like to look at for making wine and bricks is just one of them in fact i like to think that the summers in texas are so long and so hot <laughs> just about any grape grower should have no difficulty achieving the proper amount of bricks what i was seeing was grapes that were over ripened and uh grapes that are over ripened had uh very high ph's and uh, it was very difficult to deal with high pH in the winery once the fruit was harvested. So one of the important things that I saw was it, in communicating with the grape growers and making them understand the overall picture of what we're looking for as far as grapes go, that bricks wasn't the only factor. And there were other factors. Nowadays, I, I encourage our, our, what I would encourage people to do is pick the Texas grapes based more on pH and also on taste. So going out and actually tasting the flavors of the grapes, looking at the seeds for ripeness, 
Um, of course, measuring pH and, and total acidity as all our titratable acidity is the proper term. And uh, making sure that the, when the grapes are delivered to the winery, that the chemistry is in, within parameters that make it easy to work, make the grapes easy to work with. Well, wow, that's a that's a that's a really good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there thinking about the questions, like, okay, how do I make it? Yeah, you, you did a pretty good job. Of yeah. So mostly, blank. like I said, I, I would distill that that answer down by saying, the quality of the grapes that we're getting in the winery are extremely good and um, when you receive good grapes uh, it makes the winemaking process much easier and like I'd like to tell people I'd like to say that you know most of us Texas winemakers we all studied the same books as say the Calif- as the California winemakers or the French winemakers for the most part Italian winemakers so if you deliver good grapes to me in the winery there is no reason why we sh- our wines shouldn't be as good as anyone else's, be it California, France, Italy, or Spain, or anyone else's. Uh, so the quality of the grapes have gotten better. That's uh, kudos to our viticulturists, our grape growers, uh, for understanding our needs. And uh, they deliver good grapes. We should be able to make good wine. Well, now, yeah, absolutely. Obviously, this is definitely a... A matter of garbage in garbage out which is kind of I guess what has really been in the past is like you were I know that you had been saying this a few weeks ago when you were talking to me is that a lot of these a lot of these uh, wineries and stuff like that they just took a shotgun blast Mm -hmm. and said hey look we're just gonna try this grape this grape this grape Mm -hmm. this grape this grape we don't know what works well here but hey you know what if we do 25 different uh, 25 different grapes two or three are bound to hit. Right. Well, there's there's a whole history after Prohibition. You know, we're still living with the effects of Prohibition today. It's no hard kidding. to believe uh, that we're still living with the effects of Prohibition. I mean, yeah, just look at our TABC laws. Uh, they're basically a patchwork of laws that are many times nonsensical, and it's even hard to get a straight answer out of TABC <laughs> what the laws even mean. And if you, depending on who you talk to, you get a different answer and on, on a particular day, let's say. Oh, wow. So we're still dealing with the ramifications of what happened during Prohibition. It set, uh, set Texas back really far. Um, after Prohibition, you know, California, govern- the, the California state government really s- knew and saw that, hey, uh, grapes can be a really nice cash crop for us. So the California... Uh, government actually started and sponsored a lot of research, from my understanding anyway, sponsored a lot of research. So there's actual data books out there that date back to right after Prohibition, where they invested a lot of energy and time and money in discovering what grapes grew best where in Cal- in different parts of California. California is a large state, uh, kind of like Texas. I Naturally. don't think it's quite as big as Texas, but... <laughs> well, they also have the elevation changes. Exactly, and they're north and to south, so they have cooler climate up north and a warmer, warmer climate, climate down, down south, south, obviously. So uh, they'd figured out pretty quick after uh, Prohibition which grapes grew where the best. Well, in Texas, we didn't have the advantage of a government that really recognized and understood uh, that we could really grow grapes in Texas. It's starting to happen now, but even with all the cuts in funding that occurred a few years back when we had the, the recession, um, Texas wine industry was contributing for every dollar that uh, that Texas uh, supported the Texas wine industry as far as marketing dollars go. The wine industry would return $6 back to the state government. It was that much? It was huge. And... Um, so we used to get supported by the Texas uh, state government in um, uh, promoting our our wines. That all came to an end because of the recession. And even though we could justify that our the money was well spent, it they responded with something like it was unfair that they were cutting every program that they could cut. It was unfair for them oh. to not cut our industry, even though. Our Even industry. though it was a good investment, it didn't matter. Exactly. It, it was all about optics and politics being good politics and not policy being good policy. Exactly. Policy, I guess, made horrible politics. 
exactly. And, you know, I get, I kind of understand why they did that. I mean, it, the optics are bad. and Yeah, um, but still, it's six, it's 600% exactly. return it's a good on return. investment. Come on it, here. It was an excellent return, and that money has never come back to our industry either. And uh, what makes the Texas wine industry different than, say, other industry is our, our wine industry actually directly helps small family farmers. Oh, absolutely. Most of the people growing grapes in Texas are small family farmers, like my business partner, Carolyn Chancellor, who has a small vineyard in East Texas. I see how hard she goes out there on the weekends and works and uh, for not a whole lot of, of, of help and money. Um, so it's definitely a labor of love for her out in the vineyard, and it's a shame um, that we can't do more to support our small family farmers in Texas. Well, what about okay? So you had mentioned you had mentioned t- uh, California. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's take this kind of point by point that you went through on yeah. California. California back in what the late fifties, early sixties, even onto the seventies, mm-hmm. and even I guess even into the eighties, it really was kind of a joke. Mm-hmm. Like California wine, ha, 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 ha. And the people over in France or whatever is in there, you know, doing <laughs> right. the, I don't know how well that will really translate. <laughs> just, to, just to note, he just stuck his, <laughs> I won't say, I won't say. Yeah. But uh, no, now, what, what are things that we can learn as Texans in a, in a, in a smaller in a smaller wine industry that's you know about because we really didn't we didn't really start around here until what late 80s i mean that's really when a lot of stuff started i would say that the modern texas wine industry started in the 70s i guess you could argue whether it was the early 70s or the late 70s there's definitely been uh, wineries that are have been in um, modern uh, wineries that have been around over 40 years now for sure um well what are some things that because definitely there's a there's been a gap there, whereas California is just a little bit further along the mm-hmm. power curve than us. What are some things that we can learn as far mm-hmm. as the wine industry as a whole? What what are some things that we can learn from them, and uh, and, and apply here in in Texas? And I, and that means everything. That means everything from a from a vineyard mm-hmm. standpoint to a distribution standpoint to mm-hmm. a obviously governmental i i don't like getting into politics and government but quite frankly let's face it here it is a it, it is something that does have an effect on this industry and and so hey we we do have to talk about it yeah um you know california as i was saying earlier definitely had a leg up on the rest of the country because they recognized the potential in their their grape growing um i'd like to think that texas today is where California was probably in the early to mid 70s when uh, just before they really got discovered everybody knows, probably a lot of people have seen the movie uh, where they competed uh, California wines competed against French wines in a blind tasting tasting of Paris um, I'd like to think and that's where they became really recognized as being able to make quality for world-class wines I like to think that Texas wines are uh, probably equal to the challenge. Um, I think that our wines uh, are world class, uh, and I think that uh, we can compete in that in that kind of environment. Um, so, what did California do right, and what did and, and what can we? What? I'm just waving to somebody. <laughs> Sorry, somebody was just waving to me. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. What can we learn from California? Is yeah. Um, like I said, you know, they kind of had the lead in figuring out which grapes to grow. Um, I think back in the early days in Texas, uh, Texans were looking at California and saying, wow, well, they're, they're really going gangbusters on cabs and Merlots. You know, maybe we should get into that same kind of game and, and grow those same kind of grapes. Well, as we all know, Texas and California don't have the same climate. And I think something that we've learned uh, in the last couple de- decades, probably two or three decades, is that um, we are a warm weather state. We have a warm climate, and therefore we should be growing grapes that suit our climate. And it's one of those things where it's like uh, you want to, let me see if I get the expression right, uh, live where you farm, don't farm where you live. In other words, um, grow what grows well in your area and i think we were just trying to be 
like California in the early days, but now that model is completely shattered. Um, there are some cool climate grapes that are being grown in Texas successfully, but where most of our success has occurred is in the warm climate grapes, mostly the uh, southern Mediterranean varietals, uh, such as the Spanish, the Italian, and the southern French grapes. So the warm weather grapes is where we've really seen, um, by leaps and bounds, success. Yeah, yeah. Temper I think Mia. you're drinking one. <laughs> I think you're drinking one now, aren't you? Where, where's where's Temper? Is Spanish is Spain where Tempranillo comes from? Yeah. So the grape is called Tempranillo. Uh, comes from Spain. Um, also, it's the main grape in the uh, Rioja region of Spain. So they grow a lot of uh, Tempranillo. It's a warm weather grape, and we figured out a while back that guess what? Uh, we can grow Tempranillo too. And uh, most of us winemakers, most wi Texas wineries have a Tempranillo. And um, Tempranillo is quickly becoming recognized as one of the main grapes in Texas. And uh, we're all just about making a Tempranillo because it, gr it grows so well and we do such a good job with it. In fact, um, Texas Tempranillos win um, world um, wine um, medals at, at competition um, all over the world, really? we win medals, and uh, even become, in France. Um, I know, in like for example, in California, the international uh, big San Francisco wine competition that's out there. It's one of the biggest competitions in the world. Uh, Texas enters its Tempranillos, and there are many Texas wineries, and we walk away with uh, medals left and right. I I would even say that um, our I would. I would like to look this up, but I would even say that our Tempranillos um, beat uh, many Spanish Tempranillos oh, in hands hand, down. Yeah, in in direct competition. Hand, hands down, I I was up in uh, I was actually up in Denton a couple. Ah, this is probably about a month ago, and I actually drank a couple of old old world Tempranillos. Mm -hmm. Ugh, yeah, man, it's I mean it's one step away from sweet <laughs> wine. I mean, it's just, really you, you it, thought it they were they were on the sweet side, it's huh? It's way sweet. Well, at least the ones that I tried. I mean, I, there's mm -hmm. about four or five of them lined up. Most Tempranillos that I've had from Spain or from Rioja, in fact, I drank one just a, maybe a weekend or two ago, um, they're dry and, um, you know, beautiful wines, great with food. In fact, I was eating a nice ribeye. Oh, <laughs> dude. I had, with with, uh, I had a ribeye with your steak. I had a ribeye steak. I don't wish to cut you off, but no, I had a ribeye steak. <laughs> This would have been, uh, well, I actually had it at Del Frisco's, mm -hmm. and oh man, I was just sitting there thinking to myself, I was like, man, dude, if this, you know, your town actually, and I hate to, I hate to like really get down on other people's Tempranillos, but you know, yours is the number one, Thank and, you. and that's that's there's really three that there's really mm -hmm. three there's, I had one at. Uh, Pemberton Cellars, mm -hmm. and they had actually got their grapes from, I believe, Bingham. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember exactly where they the got The grapes from that Tempranillo that you're drinking are Bingham grapes from no 2012. Kidding. Yeah. Is it, so does Bingham just do that good of a job? or? Well, you know, the, the, the Tempranillo that you're drinking, uh, we call that one our barrel reserve cab. I mean, sorry, our barrel reserve <laughs> Tempranillo. I was Freudian slip there or something. <laughs> Our barrel reserve Tempranillo, it, is, uh, it was aged for five years in um, American oak barrels. Initially, it had gotten some uh, French and American oak, which, come to find out, is the same way they do it in Rioja. I found that out later after I did it. <laughs> and then it was uh, aged for five years in American oak, mostly neutral barrels. But... Um, yeah, so that's a 2012, you're drinking 2012 Bingham uh, grapes from Br Bingham there. Well, Bingham. And they're, they're a High Plains, a, a large High Plains grape grower, actually, well known for their their grapes in Texas. Yeah, it was, it's, it was up and I've always been a very huge fan of William Chris. I, I think Bill and Chris have done a phenomenal mm -hmm. job. And so uh, I will say this, they were my number one, and, um, you know, it, and it, I had your I had your uh, 2012 here. I had it with a with a sirloin. Hmm. Um, I, I had cooked it up myself, 
and um, that, it was really good. I think if you start going with leaner meats, mm-hmm. so a sirloin, a little bit leaner of a meat than a, than a ribeye naturally, mm-hmm. um, I think uh, William Chris has a, has a little bit better taste for that. I mean, mm-hmm. again, it... It, it all You're putting in. me in good company because, and then, uh, and then if you get into the heavier marbling and you get into the ribeyes and stuff, where you really get that juice, oh man, oh, you're, yeah. you're, that's where yours really, where, well, in, in my opinion. So I mean, I'm just a podcaster. So. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. You're putting in me, putting me in very good company there. Thank you for that. No, no, no. You you earned it. You earned it. So. Well, it took five years to create that wine. In fact, that's a very small batch vintage uh i think only 59 cases were produced of that wine i want to say so um i like to tell people that once it's gone it's gone forever i don't have anything else that's aged like that one was you don't have a 2013 coming out no no in fact the uh the last tempranillo we had sold out quickly so i didn't actually put any aside um, so yeah, unfortunately, being a small producer, being a small, you know, winery, uh, we don't make large batch stuff, it, and it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, that one there that you're drinking was kind of the exception, and I don't have another one to back <laughs> it up. So I'll, once it's gone, I'll probably cry, and uh, they'll find me in the fetal position somewhere in Checker Pass someday because of that, because it is uh, so nice. But it is part of you know being a winemaker and being a winery is. There's only one thing worse than having too much wine in the winery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not having yeah. any, but uh, that one will be gone. I, people that come in here that love love that wine, they'll come in and they'll buy multiple bottles at a time because uh, I think you know they know that it'll be gone someday, unfortunately. Well, another thing. So do you have any plans of doing like a – like a 2018 or anything like that? We'll or? have a, a 2017 um, a vintage out next year. Oh, okay. And uh, we'll see. And that one will probably sell out pretty quick. Um, but, yeah, I don't have anything like the one you're drinking now. It's oh. it, it tastes to me like an old world wine. It's spent so long in barrels. I mean, for people who like fruit forward wines, they're great. Uh, we've got plenty of those. But this one tastes like just an old world uh just a wine that's so clean and so nice it's really fantastic well not only that it that the part that you just touched on is the clean and that and that seems to be kind of a a texas that, that kind of seems like to like a texas a more of a texas thing you get a you get a california and i mean you mm-hmm. you drink that stuff and it seems like it sticks around in your mouth for mm-hmm. seven minutes eight minutes and th- this Texas has been taken a little bit more of the different mm-hmm. road where you you drink it, you taste it, and then it's gone, and you're on to the next. Yeah, well, that one that you're tasting there, the Tempranillo, I mean, it has a pretty long finish on it. Um, but, you know, something I think you'll find from our wines is, you know, my goal as a winemaker has always been to um, – the thing I'm trying to achieve is a very clean fermentation, wines without faults – and just uh, really luscious, yummy wines, basically. <laughs> um, I just, I'm trying to create wines without faults that are well balanced, um, that and are good on their and own. And you're doing a good job of it. <laughs> okay, so thank you. So you're, so you're hitting the mark. <laughs> well, that's what I hope to do. And I just want to create wines that are not over the top or well balanced, great with food, good on their own. And that's kind of been my mantra just clean, good yeah. drinking wines. Well, uh, Getting wow, we we went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but uh, hey, cheers! Cheers to you! Salute! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to do that. Obviously, you've done a lot of shots in your time. Oh man, the army! The army <laughs> taught me. The army taught me well. <laughs> Two uh, military guys, <laughs> no. and we and we forgive you for being in the <laughs> navy. So I yeah. was in the navy. So uh, so you're actually first generation here from. From Italy, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, so the way I like to describe it is um, both my grandparents had wineries in Italy, of course. I mean, they're Italian. They're going to make wine. Uh, my father lived on the farm until he was about 20 years old. He was actually born in America because uh, there was a And time then went back? And went back to Italy because my grandfather came over and loved America. And he 
uh, had my father and my aunt, and he also had family uh, children in Italy that they left at the convent. It was, you know, those were hard times. So they actually left them at... at they left uh, two young boys in the convent with the nuns, uh, came to America. My grandfather worked, worked very hard to save some money. Uh, my father and my aunt were born here in the U.S., so they were technically American citizens. And then when the Depression hit, as much as my grandfather loved America, which the plan was always to reunite the family and go back to Italy, they decided it was time to go back. When they went back to Italy, he had saved enough money where he was able to buy land from the land baron in Italy. And uh, between him, his sister, and his brother, they owned basically the side of a, of a small mountain or whatever. Where well, they how grew. many acres is that? I don't have any ideas. Of course, they measure it in hectares back then. But well, yeah, well. It's it's fairly good size. Uh, the property was split after the death of my grandparents, and my father sold the property off just before he passed. Um, but, um, yeah, that was the homestead, the uh, <laughs> the farm in, in Italy. and they, But they grew everything. They grew their, you know, obviously they had, like, um, So they wheat. were crop farmers. They crop were crop farm. farmers. They had wheat. They had... Uh, vineyards, you know, chickens. I mean, it was a full functioning farm. No kidding. And a lot of the the, the town's folks lit, worked on the farm as well, so that provided uh, food and income for them. No kidding. So it was it was during very hard times, right after uh, and during World War II in oh. Italy. <laughs> yeah, that was so, a, that was yeah, a pretty was, rough time for you guys. And the village was occupied by Nazis. And uh, so it was uh, some interesting times. My father grew up on the farm when he turned 20. Uh, I like to say that it skipped a generation with my father. He really wanted nothing to do with the farm. Came to America, met my Sicilian mother, who had immigrated as uh, a teenager. And uh, me and my sister were born. So there you go. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went into the Navy. and Yeah, I spent six years in the Navy. I was in the nuclear Navy uh, working on nuclear reactors. And... Uh, got out and got to, ta got to Texas as quickly as possible. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Well, hey, I got, uh, I got uh, the Army said you're going to Fort Hood, and that was about, uh, was about as far as I got. So, <laughs> so But, uh, no, I've, I've actually started getting on a little bit of a Roman, Roman Empire kick here the last, the last few weeks. And, nice. you know, I, actually, I don't know if you know, I, I, I work, I, I'm an architectural uh, drafter. Architectural nice. designer is uh, specializing in roof systems, so it's very, very boring during the day. And so, one of the things that I do is I always listen to podcasts, mm -hmm. and I've kind of stumbled across one. It's uh, it's actually called Hardcore History. Nice. And uh, actually, I was I, I kind of was I was listening to it, but then I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent here about two weeks ago, and it was how wine actually uh, influenced the Roman Empire, and so. What I actually found out was if there was no Roman wine, there would have been no Roman Empire. Hmm. So to bring everyone back to what Roman was, Rome actually was just a city-state. And it was Rome, and about 30 miles outside of Rome is all that they had contact with. But, I mean, obviously back then, 30 miles, I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a couple-day trek. So, you know, hey, having influence that big was very, very... Uh, and and they weren't very strong. Mm -hmm. At that, everyone likes to think of the Roman Empire as a as a as an army that's absolutely on the march. Mm -hmm. Julius Caesar, the Republic, every they, they like to think of all that stuff. And what they don't realize is at the beginning. Mm -hmm. See, they had these these individuals called Gauls. Oh yeah, the Gauls, the yeah. French. Yeah. So uh, what they actually what they actually found out was, oh, what's that? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm getting. I'm handing. I'm being handed a note. <laughs> We're, I'm not in trouble. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. We can edit. No, that's okay. We're editing it. Editing it out. <laughs> it was about an order that was uh, gets, is getting ready to be. Put oh, in. okay. Yeah, the Gaul uh, actually the, had a, an influence on the Roman Empire. Well, with what wine. what happened there was uh, the Gauls were a lot stronger than. The, were actually a lot stronger than the Romans at, at the beginning. And so what the Romans actually did was they started influencing them with merchandise. So they started trading with them. Mm -hmm. And so what happened, what they, what the, the Dan Carlin was, uh, is actually the guy who actually does hardcore history, he calls them the toga-wearing Gauls. 
So what happened there was the Romans found out that instead of going toe-to-toe with these dudes, if they gave them wine for, you know, three, four generations, mm-hmm. they would go from, and, and I'm using Dan Carlin's thing, so, so this is not me, uh, it, on, a, on a scale of one to ten, you know, one being the most barbarian and ten being, uh, you know, one step away from Roman citizens, mm-hmm. What they found out was that if they gave the first generation wine and they started chilling out and they stopped going around thumping each other on the head and, <laughs> you know, getting drunk and then, you know, thumping other people on the head. And eventually after they get done thumping all those people on the head, they go to Rome and start thumping mm-hmm. those heads. What they found out was that if they gave them wine and they chilled out and then they started giving them food, okay, and they started mm-hmm. doing trade that way, what they found out was that these guys would just chill out, relax, mm-hmm. and then become influenced by Rome through the politi- through the political side of it, sure. not the military. And so if they wouldn't have been able to galvanize those relationships and those alliances early on, Rome would have, ne- Rome would have probably been, uh, history would have been re- wrote completely different, mo- mainly, be- mainly because of the, Cel- uh, the Celtic people. That's amazing. People failed to realize it, but the Celts actually were not just, at, at one point, the reason why they are actually in the British Isles is because the Romans pushed them there. Wow. The, Ro- the, the, the Celtic people actually came all the way down to modern day uh, Switzerland. And, Interesting. Yeah, and so and so when Julius Caesar and everyone else, well, actually it wasn't Julius Caesar, I can't think, uh, well, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny the Older, Pliny the Younger, these are other uh, historians. Mm-hmm. Um, Suetonius is in there too, and what they actually do is they talk about, the, they, actually chrono- they, they, they actually go chronologically how the uh, Celtic people were actually pushed out of, mainland Europe and pushed across the channel. Interesting. You know, I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, history, so I get sucked into all those shows. (laughs) Um, What I would heard also was, uh, you know, trade goes both ways, right? Absolutely. And the one thing uh, that we use in the winery today that was influenced by Gaul, do you know what that was? Uh, Please. Wood barrels. Uh, Gauls taught the Romans to use wood barrels. From my understanding, I'm not a historian, don't you know? But my understanding is, in Gaul, they were using wood barrels to transport uh, foods and products. And the Romans, I think, were still using amphorae, like the Greeks. Oh, okay. So like a like a clay almost, like a clay pot essentially, and stacking clay pots vertically <laughs> in a <laughs> ship to transport them uh, was difficult, but that's what they did. And then I think the Romans uh, saw that Gauls were using wood barrels. They were coopering and uh, adapted, I believe, the wood cooperage from the Gauls. And so that's why even until today, we continue to use wood barrels in the winery. Uh, We have not found really anything as good as storing wine in a wood barrel. And that's something that's (laughs) been around for thousands of years. With all the technology that we have. It's really amazing because, you know, if you think about it, uh, wine technology, I mean, you know, we make wine in a modern winemaking way. But yet when you walk into the uh, barrel room, you still see barrels that a Roman or a Gaul, someone from Gaul, would, would feel comfortable with. We haven't found anything to be, you know, as yeah. good as, as, as those for containers. Well, now what about, I mean, I know I, we, I just went out to uh, Keppersol here. Uh, actually, yeah. When Keeper I, Saul. Yeah. Keeper Saul. Yeah. Keeper, Keeper Saul. Yeah. Is that how you say it? Yeah, it's Keeper Saul. It's a, a South African name for the winery. The founder of the winery, uh, Rest of Soul, Pierre, he was from South Africa. And, uh, yeah, named the, uh, the winery after a tree in South Africa. No kidding. So a lot of people don't see you can, if, as you can see there, we've got so much interesting history right here in our backyard uh, with wineries and winemaking, I mean, we can just go on and on. Well, yeah, they had a uh, they had a stainless they, they had a wine out there, and they called it, uh, that last portion of it was stainless steel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it, it, I mean, it it kind of was a little bit sharper than mm-hmm. than a than a traditional wine, but I mean, hey, I didn't I didn't think it was that bad. I mm-hmm. still would prefer. I mean. I I didn't have their Tempranillo. That was mm-hmm. stainless steel. Mm-hmm. I don't even think they have a Tempranillo stainless steel. I, I don't know. I think I may have had one of their Tempranillos in the past before. I'm trying to remember. Uh, but, yeah, anybody who hasn't been to Keepersall in East Texas near um, 
Tyler, Texas. That's, yeah, that's Tyler. And it is a fantastic, it's a beautiful, pl- beautiful place. And they also have they also have spirits out there. So if you don't yep. like wine uh i tried their uh, their um, vodka mm-hmm. love their vodka yeah I, that, that was abs- that was excellent i still think as far as their other spirits um i still think tx whiskey uh, beats them out on that mm-hmm. side of the coin but their vodka was excellent yeah. it's an interesting place to go because they have something like 62 acres of yeah. vineyard yeah. in east in the beautiful east texas rolling hills They've got this fantastic uh, barrel or tasting room. Uh, I think they used to have a barrel room that was attached to it. I'm not sure how yeah, it's I'd, situated I'd, now. I, but can't, I, I don't think they actually have that anymore. Or, it, oh, I don't think they do. Anyways. Yeah, because I, I think they may it. have expanded their tasting room. So, But I think there is like a still barrel stored there. Uh, they have a uh, next building over is the distillery. So you get to uh, kind of see how they uh, distill their products. So the whole experience out there, plus, of course, they have a bed and breakfast and everything. Oh, yeah. It's just wonderful. And um, they have been a real, uh, uh, almost this amazing uh, viticultural location. There have been scientists come down and studied how they're growing grapes at Keepersall. No Because kidding. everybody claims that there's no way they should be growing the grapes that they're growing in their vineyard. But somehow they're still able to grow them there. And uh, Pierre, who was the founder, he was definitely a farmer. And he even worked in California. He was huge in the almond industry, if my recollection is correct. And he was a true farmer. And he was able to grow things, and they continue to grow things out there, that people say shouldn't grow. Well. <laughs> so they're doing something right out there at Keepersall. And I would encourage everybody not just to go out there just for the beauty, but for the whole experience. Oh, and yeah. It's a, and it's, a great, it's a great drive. Yeah. And, and, not, and that it's, far. it's not, o- not only that. It, they're, they're, they have, a, they have a, a restaurant out there, too. Mm-hmm. And that's just as good. I mean, it, on a food-wise, it's mm-hmm. a, it just as good as their wines. I mean, it's a little it's a little odd driving there because you're actually driving through a subdivision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, their their vineyard winery. I don't know who came first, the chicken or the egg, but is located. You have to drive through basically like a small, like a residential yeah. uh, community. Oh, it's beautiful. You out come there through too. the back of the residential community, and you come out to this beautiful piece of property that they have out there, um, and it's fantastic. They're they're continuing the traditions out there that Pierre started. So kudos. To them, they're definitely worth the drive out oh, to East absolutely. Texas. And he used to he used to sing to the he used to bring out the mariachi band <laughs> <laughs> and sing to the sing to the vines. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that was pretty cool. You know, hey, that's kind of one of those little quirks that yeah, you know what, it's cool. No yeah, matter. it's pretty neat. You know, yeah. everybody has their kind of their little niche, and everybody does their own thing in Texas. I mean, granted, we're all cowboys. We're all a little strange. We all kind of. Are, <laughs> Kind of wildcatters, I guess you would call us. So yeah. uh, that's kind of what's partly what's fun about being in the Texas wine industry is uh, we're not bound by traditions. Yeah. We're not bound. Tradition is what you make it. Exactly. And uh, we're creating our own traditions. We're creating our own wines in the styles that we want. No one is dictating to us what we have to make. If I lived in Burgundy, I'd probably have the choice of two grapes that I could grow and still be an authorized winery. And, and wine in Burgundy, and so it's fun. You know, we can we can use different varietals. We can make wines in any style we want. We don't have to follow tradition. We can experiment, and it's part of the fun of being a Texas winemaker. Well, yeah. Now, getting back to the have you have you actually read uh, HB fifteen fourteen the uh, the bill that's actually truth and advertisement. Oh, what's that one say? Uh, that one says that uh, 100% Texas wine, or 100% Texas grapes are the only thing that can be labeled Texas wine. Yeah, so that was something that came up in this last uh, legislative session. Yep. Uh, there Chris, was, Bond, uh, Chris from uh, yeah. William, William Chris, actually. Was yeah, so there were uh, s- some wineries down in the Hill Country mostly that were proponents of calling uh, – um, changing the percentage of Texas wines to 100%. So to be called a Texas wine, 100% of the grapes had to be grown in Texas. Now, currently at Checkered Past, 100% of our Checkered Past wines are Texas wines. Texas wines. And uh, I always say, you know, if I can get my grapes in Texas 
from Texas Farmers, that's always going to be my first choice. Absolutely. Um, so was it, the law, I think, is 75%? It's uh, 85%. Okay, so it's 75 if you're not in an AVA. Oh, okay, okay. If, so if you don't want to call your wine Hill Country or if you don't want to call your wine uh, High Plains, which is an AVA, an American viticulture area, yep. I think the requirement's a little tighter. It says 85%. Otherwise, if you don't call out a region in the state, than uh, a recognized growing region in the state, then I think it's 75. So the debate came back and forth. And um, um, the thing with Texas grapes is we don't always get a harvest year in and year out. Hey, it's a tough place to... It's to farming, play. right? Yeah. And hail, uh, com- hail comes in and that's exactly. it. Exactly. We ha- we'll have a late freeze. So from time to time... Um, it becomes a necessity to get grapes from outside the state. I mean, otherwise, you're going to be putting people out of business. Absolutely. So the argument becomes, okay, so is the wine made in the vineyard or is the wine made in the winery? So, you know, obviously, uh, when you buy roasted uh, coffee that was roasted down the street and they put the little Texas symbol on there because – they roasted the coffee. In Obviously, Texas, those yeah. beans didn't come from Texas. <laughs> and uh, and same with beer, right? When beer, the how many of the hops are grown in Texas? Probably none. Uh, just about none, right? Yeah. I mean, most of that stuff probably is coming from up north somewhere, probably Minnesota. Right. So it becomes an argument, and this was actually a test question in my when I was taking uh, analogy and viticulture. They actually, they actually this had the was question. an actual test question. It was, where do you believe wine is made? It was like an essay question so there's probably so know, there was really no right or wrong exactly. answer it's just you want they wanted to see if, how you would defend it exactly it was it was debatable right it was a, like a debate yeah. question if you're on the debate team in high school right or college and so oh, that's a long time do you, ago. Be- <laughs> <laughs> do you believe that uh texas wines are made in the vineyard or do you believe that texas wines are made in the winery where is the value added it boils down to where is, does the winemaker just you know pitch yeast and call it done, or does the or or is it something else? You know, if it was a matter of just pitching yeast, I wouldn't have went to college for just just to pitch yeast. <laughs> uh, there's a lot more to winemaking than just pitching yeast, and um, so that's where the debate came. What percentage and should we go to a hundred percent model? Well, the, there is adva- obviously advantages and disadvantages of both one is and and, you know maybe this is something we need to learn from california i don't know i'll just throw this out there and see what you think i mean if if we want if we as a texas wine industry want to be recognized as a distinct and unique wine Mm -hmm. that has a distinct and unique taste Mm -hmm. uh, shouldn't it i mean shouldn't we have the I mean, shouldn't we be the ones that uh, determine that? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was in California and I was selling grapes or a juice mm-hmm. to someone in Texas, mm-hmm. let's face it here, that's a 2,000-mile trek mm-hmm. um, across some of the most harsh environment as far as heat is concerned mm-hmm. uh, in the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. you got Death Valley right there. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on here. It can't get much worse than that. And then you got Arizona, you got New Mexico, and then you got Texas. It, it seems to me like, you know, shoot, for them to, they're not going to put out their best grapes. They're not going to sell their best stuff because, quite frankly, that it, uh, it, 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 they, want it, they want their best to be known right. for them. Or them you know, be- though, there are people that I know in this industry that buy Napa grapes. Yeah. And they have contracts with Napa growers, uh, and they're buying, you know, quality grapes, top dollar. And uh, they're making wine with those grapes. It's not something I do. I'm not defending the argument yeah. one way or the other. I'm just laying. Yeah. I just wanna, I'm just really lay just the, trying to lay. lay it out for people. But um, there are people that buy high-end quality Napa grapes. The discussion isn't like we're going to call it Napa because well, by yeah. law you can't because we're more than, I think the law is one state away or something like that. It's what whoa, whoa, whoa. I told you these laws, these TABC laws if are If it's are one, okay, so if it was Nevada. Yes, if we were could, one state away, I think you could still use the AVA, believe it or not. 
But so what happens in the truck? <laughs> so I, I don't state know. State one and state two. I know. I'm, I'm, I think that's a federal law, actually. Right, then, okay. It, I don't want to delve into eye, that. We're keeping an eye on you, Arizona. <laughs> and I don't want to delve into getting too <laughs> technical here. Yeah. But, um, you know, from time to time in the past, in my past, before checkered pass, uh, you know, we did have to uh, utilize grapes from other locations. And we always... Uh, use the American viticulture area. So we literally put American on the label. Yeah. And not uh, called it, te- then did not call it Texas. That was a choice that we made. So, uh, so I mean, I, I mean, I, I can see both sides of the, of the issue. It just becomes a problem when grapes are not, are not available in Texas because of a really poor harvest. Uh, the proponents of this bill were a lot of the folks that seemed to be able to have vineyards in lots of parts of the state and had access to more grapes, in my opinion. Um, so they, are, of course, were proponents of it. They had a yeah. leg up over other people. But, um, yeah, it's, it's still debatable. Um, it's, it's definitely a debate question. Well, the, well, the other area, I was, talking to, I was talking to James from OG Sellers, and uh, he was saying that you know, he was talking about it from a tax perspective. He was saying that why should somebody who goes and buys grapes at seven hundred or eight hundred or nine hundred dollars a a ton versus somebody paying sixteen, seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars a ton, why should they have the equal status as far as tax is concerned? Mm-hmm. You know, here's a here's a guy who goes out and just buys it from California, brings it in from California, mm-hmm. and now all of a sudden he has the same uh, mm-hmm. tax status as someone who actually went out there and. And cranked up the John Deere. Yeah. You know? Well, like I said, uh, something that, you know, Checkered Pass tries to do, and it's, it's in our, uh, if you read our house rules, we like to support local. Absolutely. And my business partner is a grape grower. Uh, I want to support as, mo- as many local family farmers as possible, as many Texans as possible. So it's, you know, our policy to always get grapes, always get grapes within the state well it's not only it's it's not just the farmers it's the logistics people personnel in between that it's it's all it's all the facets of that it's the yeah it's the laborer in the field yeah it's the farmer that actually owns the land yes it is the logistics guy yes it is the winery itself yes it is then the logistics from Mm -hmm. you know from point a to point b and then it's then it's the waiter and the waitress Mm-hmm. So actually, stop making the sale. Yeah, and that's that's uh, that's absolutely we need to be mm-hmm. supporting and, Texas as much as possible. And you know that's one of the things. I mean, I love my brethren in the uh, beer industry. I do. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I do love them. But uh, one thing that makes wine special is um, it really helps Texans out. You know, we talked about the six dollars to one ratio of uh, money when when the state government was supporting us back in the day. Um, Texans who buy Texas wines, wines from local Texas wineries, really support that whole infrastructure you just mentioned. Everybody from the field hands to the people that are in transportation to the winemakers themselves. I mean, we're all very small family farmers there's only that's a, all that's what it comes down to there's only a handful of large wineries in texas well also on top of that you really okay so you take some i i have friends who are in the california wine industry heavily as mm-hmm. far as brokers as far as and not just brokers of wine itself but brokers of grapes brokers mm-hmm. there really isn't that infrastructure here Mm-hmm. in texas no a lot of it is just hey it's done on a handshake mm-hmm. it's done the old-fashioned way mm-hmm. my great 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 granddaddy came here to texas grew yep. this and grew that and uh, has been doing business and, and, and did business with your great 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 granddaddy exactly well, and you know that's just that's just how it's that's how it always is my business partner's fifth generation texan you know, I said I got here as fast as I could, right? I'm only first-generation American, for God's sakes. 
<laughs> and I and I found my way to Texas. Hey, I'm a first generation Texan. I, the, the army decided that uh, Fort Hood was <laughs> was was my drop off point. And actually, I got out in 2009, so uh, it was one of those things where going back up to New Hampshire, yeah, it, it, the economy is horrible. Another but, guy from New England. Me too. Oh man, I, I and another thing too is then the. They got this uh, stuff up there. It's white and it's fluffy <laughs> and, and uh, comes down and between it's, about. It's starting to fall yeah, now. Yeah, I yeah, heard they had, uh, they had snow up in the mountains in New York today. Oh, man. So, yeah, it's hard to believe. We were just in almost, what, in the 90s the other day yeah. down here? Yeah. Which is uh, quite the change. <laughs> um, no, but, but back to, to the California real quick. Um, you know, I like to jokingly say, but it's really actually true, is they, they spill more wine than I make. Uh, as a small Texas winery. Um, so what we consider to be, say, a large winery in Texas, they would consider to be a very small winery in California. So so how many, uh, okay, so you're doing 59, 59 cases of this town. Mm-hmm. Basically t- about two barrels. Yeah. We made about two barrels or had in reserve two barrels of that Tempranillo that you're drinking now. Oh, okay, so... so uh, California. What's mm-hmm. what's the scale difference between say oh, that? Really, I mean, it's that big. Huh? It, it's 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 day and night. You know, if you think about it, I mean, you, you go to the grocery store, you see all these California wines, you see all these Italian wines. I mean, just to export wine out of your state, which we can get into that whole discussion about. You know, Texas wines are predominantly sold in Texas. Oh yeah, ninety eight percent. Not many Texas wines are sold outside the state, and it's because one. We're a small industry still within the state. <laughs> well, and yeah, we, thirteen billion dollars. Yeah, that's a small. Well, that I suppose that in, that includes tourism as well. And exactly, and and if all things being equal, if you look at the California uh, model and our model, you would see the difference in scale. Um, and we are also blessed in Texas to have a pretty large uh, market in Texas. I mean, the population of Texas is really large. Oh yeah. So we don't really have a need. To do a lot of export outside the state. Well, just to put things in perspective, the state that I came that I come from is New Hampshire, one point one million people, mm-hmm. the entire state. Mm-hmm. Okay, now these are two thousand ten, two thousand twelve numbers, so it opioids probably might have killed off mm-hmm. a bunch more of those. But hey, you know, and and people influxing into Texas, so it's probably even more now. But. One of the things that uh, I realized was just the DFW area, mm-hmm. just the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan mm-hmm. area, mm-hmm. which really it's only, what, 40 miles by about 50 miles. It's really not that big of an 6.6 million people. Yeah. I mean, it was literally 6 to 1 mm-hmm. for every one person that's in New Hampshire, that's the amazing. entire state, 13 uh, 13 counties it's was true. was uh, was just as was one sixth the size of just the Dallas Fort Worth area. And when I went to Sicily this summer on uh, my annual vacation, I try to take my uh, every year, anyways. Uh, I take my wife to Sicily and kind of <laughs> decompress a little bit for about 12 days out of the year. Oh, that's um, good. We were asking the Sicilians how many people lived in all of Sicily. And it was like five million or five and a half million. So if you think about it, there's more people that live in Dallas that live in all of Sicily. <laughs> so yeah, it kind of puts everything into perspective yeah. when you when you think. Oh, about we're it. we're stacked up on top of each other. And if you, I don't know if you've ever been up at the Plano Way or anything like that, but that place is just exploded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually live in North Texas. I have my winery, my place down here in, in the city, in downtown Dallas, but. Uh, where do yeah. you where do you live? I actually live in Richardson. Oh no it or kidding! Not. Yeah, and I used to commute to East Texas about eighty plus miles each way back and forth to the winery, and uh, yeah, that made me decide <laughs> that when I opened up my own place and I wanted to open it up <laughs> in Dallas, a little a little closer than eighty a miles, a little closer to home was the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, shoot, I mean, I when we well we went out to Enoch Stomp there the the last the last go around and. I mean, it, it. You just drank that Montepulciano. What, mm-hmm. wh- what are your thoughts on that? Oh, it's really good, and I thank you for uh, <laughs> bringing that to me. And uh, yeah, no we, problem. We enjoyed it. Um, I thought the color was fantastic on it. Um, the taste, it was really clean, 
It had a great taste, um, long lived. I think it was one of the. It's been one of the better wines that I've tasted. I haven't been out to Enoch Stomp, Enoch Stomp in a long time, and uh, you know they were another fellow uh, East Texas winery. Um, but yeah, it seems like they're doing a great job out there as yeah, well. I, I think they actually even got because that that's a uh, that that grape actually I think actually came from Bingham too. Yeah, Montepulciano, and there's a few people in Texas. Dukeman, I believe, is another one that's making a Montepulciano. Uh, Cristoval is making a Montepulciano in uh, Southwest Texas. Uh, so there's, a, there's yeah. Montepulciano. It's an Italian grape. And I think that it has real potential in Texas. It's another one of those warm weather grapes. Well, yeah, and also on top of that, one of the things that I, I didn't I didn't really recognize it until a little bit later, but every time I've tasted a Montepulciano, every I, I've liked it. I've liked it all. Mm-hmm. So that is definitely the grape. But mm-hmm. uh, well, it has well, an interesting flavor, and uh, like I said, you know. The southern Mediterranean varietals in Texas, we're starting to figure out that really do well here, and we can compete on a worldwide level, uh, and they're just as good as anybody's wines. Um, so it's really fun right now to be in this industry at in, in a point where hopefully in a few years uh, we'll, we'll be where like California was yeah. back in about 1976 when they won the uh, the tasting there, the blind tasting in Paris. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I mean, we're at uh, we're at an hour and two minutes, <laughs> but it uh, looks like we're going to have you here probably back in a little while now. So, well, I appreciate you coming in the Checkered Past, um, and thanks again for coming down and we appreciate hey, no what you what you're doing in the uh, Texas wine industry and promoting us. And uh, no, you you guys are doing all the work. I well, ju- I just talk. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I do. I, I blow hot air. <laughs> well, thanks to you guys for getting the word out, and thanks to our local uh, Texas farmers that are working out there and doing a great job, and all the Texas winemakers. It's, it's been a great ride, and uh, we're going to just keep it going. Pedal right. to the metal. All right. Well, hey. All right. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Bye.